Obviously, today what we're going to, we're continuing our series or finishing it up, and we're going to focus mostly on kids. And we've been talking about one of the things one of the things that's kept coming up is uh, is is that we want to do everything that we do for the glory of God. And obviously, you want to raise your children to the glory of God, and sometimes that seems like an impossible task. Uh, but in addition to that, one of the things we talked about last week is we talked about how it's important to stand together, how it's important to kind of support one another and to be unified against the enemy, to be unified in your goals as far as what you want to be as a married couple. But it also is very important to stand together as parents. And uh, so anyway, at this point, what we're going to do is we're just going to talk mostly about uh, parenting together. And um, while we've been getting ready for this, um, I can't, I, I've had some, um, I, I don't know, I, I've had some concerns about my own children. Um, I, some of you probably had some of these same concerns, but I've noticed some things over the past several months that have really, really um, got me worried, and one of them is the fact that somehow at some point Cross has lost the ability to speak English. <laughs> Because he does this thing where if you ask him a question, here's what comes out. Uh. Yes, hey, Cross, can you get up? Uh. Right? Or, you know, Cross, do you want something to eat? Uh. Or, Cross, can you go tell your mommy you love her this afternoon or whatever? She just got home. Uh. You know, and, and it's different versions. Sometimes I feel like I'm talking about, I'm talking to Groot, you know, from Guardians of the Galaxy. That's, uh, Brantley, on the other hand, she has somehow lost her ability to hear anything. Absolutely. She, she hears absolutely nothing. So, like, you, you'll just be talking to her, and she does not respond whatsoever. You can ask her direct questions, and she's still talking about something that maybe we started talking about 20 minutes ago or whatever. And but so so this got me wondering there there must be something not right with them. So so I I uh, haven't taught science for a while, and and qualified as a scientist of course. So I'd do some make some scientific observations about my children. So I just did some simple things. So the first thing I did is I I just asked some simple questions. So I asked. Well, here's a question, just an example of one question I ask. You, you pick them up at school or they come home from school, and you say, how was school today? Answer, can I go to Ireland? Yeah. You've just asked me, you, you've just responded to my question with a question completely unrelated to anything I just said, right? There's got to be something wrong. <laughs> and then you, go to, you, you do something like, uh, for example, I'm going outside to play, and I say, okay, put on some shoes. They don't put on the shoes. So I say, I go to the door, hey, get the shoes on. You, you forgot to put your shoes on. It's 40 degrees outside. Oh, okay, but continues to ignore and goes over to the neighbor's house anyway barefooted. But the problem is they don't have any shoes because they left them over there, right? And I have the neighbor's shoes, so... Or you say something like, hey, go get a bath. Very simple, you know, request. Why? Well, did you have a bath yesterday? No. Well, when, when was the last time you had a bath? We believe in Febreze in our kids. I, I don't know when I last had. Then definitely go get a bath. You know? You can spray them, but so yeah. much, right? <laughs> and, then, and here's the good one. So, y'all, you parents probably have had this thing where you walk by the room and it's like, oh, man, I got to get in there and clean that up. <laughs> you ever done that? Now, yeah, I know some of you are like, well, I'll make my child clean it up. Well, good luck. Um, <laughs> and uh, so one day after three or four days of this, I decided I'm going to go in there and clean it up, and I pull back the covers, and what do I see? A plate of some food, and it's been there I don't know how long. Yeah. I'm surprised it's not, you know, there's not animals in there doing all kinds of things. But, and so here's my, my scientific conclusion. 
at some point during the middle of the night, some weeks ago, some months ago, I think a bug crawled up into my children's ear, and they eat away at the membrane <laughs> between their brain and their ear hole. And gradually, their brains have been leaking out. And so right now, they, they do not have brains. And my fear is, because I taught middle school for nine years, my fear is that this will be the case until they're about 25, I assume. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I hear. So, But anyway, so we're, we want to talk to you about your kids today, and I'm sure some of you have all felt that way at some point in your life. And, uh, and so that's what we want to get into today is talking about your kids. And I, I want to read from Ephesians chapter 6, 1 to 4. And this is from the New Living Translation. It says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. You can tell Paul didn't have children because he just gives this command as if it was heard by the children. But anyway, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment without, with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and the instruction that comes from the Lord. Father, we pray you bless the reading, the teaching, and the hearing of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So in this passage, you can draw out um, three phases in how to raise your children. Um, the first is the discipline phase, and that's between the ages of zero to five. Then you have the teaching training phase, which is the ages between five and 12. And then you have discipleship and coaching between the ages of 12 to 18. Um, and all of this is, is pointed out in this passage. Um, and so this morning we want to talk about how important it is in each one of these phases and how important discipline is. It's very important at a young age um, to discipline your, your child um, and do it the way that God models also in the Bible. He disciplines his children, correct? Therefore, we are, it's, it's up to us um, to discipline our children as, as well. And he also tells us that um, we should teach our children. Um, we need to teach them about life, ob obviously, but also God and how God is the center of our life and their life and how God should be number one no matter what. Um, and, and through that, once you, know, you have that relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that's the foundation from which you build on. And this has to be taught to your children, just not here in church, not by just a, you know, a, a Sunday school class or whatever, but it has to be taught at home. It's your responsibility. God gave you those kids. Here's, I would add this, and this is one of the things I was, uh, I was thinking about this while I was walking the dog the other day, and it was like, you know, so many times we want to teach our children how to be good people, you know, to be kind and considerate and that kind of thing. But the basis upon which we do that, if we do not teach them about God and who God is, there is no basis from which to have goodness and kindness. You know, if, if, if there is just simply the, um, the cosmos, there is no God, then, then on what basis do we teach our children right and wrong? On what basis do we teach our children good and bad? Uh, and so I think it's really important that we make God the very center of our teaching. Uh, because what this does is it now gives them a foundation for the morals and the principles that we would seek to instill in them. Uh, and also to remind them that they're accountable to that. So. Yeah. And the things we need to teach them is obviously Bible stories. You can do that at a young age. Um, you know, even teach them things about the church. Teach them things about um, the relationships. Um, and, and those are the things that we as parents are responsible to do. Another one is discipleship and coaching. Um, not just the what, but how you ought, ought to live. And as um, Sam was talking about, with God being your foundation, if, if we're not careful, it'll be like we put a bunch of these rules and these kids have to get checks in the box. And I think that bleeds over to us as adults as when we um, start coming to church, we think we've got to have all these checks in the box to have a relationship with God when, it, when it's not like that at all. You know, we love God and we serve him because of what Jesus has done for us. And we have to train and teach our kids into that 
as well. Yeah. And I think the one thing to kind of keep in mind is when you look at like these phases, uh, these are phases that easily overlap. It's not like, hey, they're out of the discipline stage. You're going to be disciplining, you know, for a while, you know, but and now they're into the teaching phase. So these are like phases that overlap. But but I think kind of to help us navigate through these phases, um, and, and this is something that Brooks and I are still learning. Some of you that have children that are, you know, older than our children, you could probably give us some advice and tell us where some of this don't work, you know. Uh, but one of the things I've tried to do is go to the Bible. Uh, you know, God's Word is God's Word. And if anybody knows how to raise children, God knows how to do it. Uh, and so one of the things I was trying to do is kind of go to the Bible and rather than get real down into the nitty-gritty is to give you what I think are some basic principles and let me just say this, there are many times where I'm sure Brooks and I would fall short into trying to live up to these biblical principles of marriage. And you probably would too, but I would encourage you not to get too discouraged with this. You can always start where you're at. Now, obviously, the earlier you start with this, the better, but you can always start where you're at. You can always you know, go to, the, to your children and say, look, I've not done things the right way, and here I want to start from this point on getting it right. Um, and, and so when we look at these principles, again, these are biblical principles I think would be very helpful for us, whether your children are, you know, just born or if they're 18 years old. Uh, these are things I think that we should kind of keep in mind as we try to navigate our children through these different phases of life. And the first one that we have here is discipline with love. Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, a youngster's heart is filled with foolishness. Every parent said, amen, right? Let me, I'll tell you how foolish children can be. Brantley, she has the uh, desire for some reason, she gets on top of our counter. Our counter is about four foot away from our couch in the living room. And the counter is probably this high. She will jump from that counter to the couch, hit it, and do a flip onto the couch. Now, she doesn't realize, but I realize she might slip. Uh, at the same time, in between those bouncy places in the couch is a two-before that frames that couch. If she misses and hits that two-before instead of the bouncy spot, she's going to uh, she's going to hurt herself, maybe break you know break a leg or whatever. See, children are filled with foolishness. They, they have no idea that their actions at times have consequences. And the Bible says we're born in sin. How many of you have ever had to teach your children to be bad? It just comes natural, don't it, right? So this is what this passage is saying, is that their heart is filled with foolishness, but physical discipline will drive it away. And we need to learn to do that. Now, what that looks like for each, cha- each parent, each child is always a little bit different. Uh, and, and we'll kind of go through some of that. But uh, as we look at it, we, we need to understand it's not like children come out of the womb knowing better. They don't. And they need us to give them that wisdom. So. Um, and we need to be careful for how, well, what we discipline them for. And I say that because, you know, if your kid's three and four, five, I mean, and you go out to eat and they have a, a heavy, I don't know, drink, and it doesn't have a lid on it, and they spill it, should we really discipline them? Because they're only three or four years old. No, they can't hold it, you know? Yeah. And I think sometimes that's where we we get it wrong is we discipline them for the wrong things that, hey, they're kids, they're going to do that. I know um, one thing that we didn't discipline for and is that I love to paint. I love to draw. I re- Well, a couple of years ago, I had to paint this huge picture of a line, I don't know, six foot by something. And the kids were used to seeing paint everywhere. Um, and anytime I paint, yeah, I leave a mess. Anything I touch, I leave a mess on. Yeah. That's how Brantley is. And so anyway, long story short, one day we see that Brantley has taken permanent magic markers and have drawn on our wall. And she was proud of it. I'm not going to do Oh, yeah, she comes and said, hey, let me show you what I did, you yeah. know. And I was like, and I'm uh, like, let's put, a, let's put a frame around it. You know, that's some artistic ability there. But I don't need to get upset and discipline her because that's what she's seen her mama do. However, later on when we say you don't do this, then we will discipline after the fact because she has been told um, 
multiple times from then. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. But, however, like with that instance, it was just last week. The kids with some neighbors, um, kids came over, and they broke out paint on the concrete. There's concrete all, I mean, paint all over the concrete underneath the garage. That's, okay, we've not really said do not paint the concrete. But, you know, I talked to both of them and, well, the neighbor's kids as well, and they know now, you know. But I'm not going to get upset and angry when I didn't lay that out or when they're just being kids. But, yeah, that was. Yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and I, I read this somewhere else, and I think it's really good, is like here's three things you, you might want to think about discipline your kids for, and that is dishonesty disrespect or uh, disobedience. If they just outright defy you, if they're disrespectful to somebody or they lie to you, you know, those are moments where you want to say, hey, no, we don't, we don't do this. Uh, I'll give you an example. You know, the other night, uh, Cross came downstairs and, and he knows, you know, when you come from down, you know, from upstairs, you know, turn the lights off, whatever. And, and I just got out of my mouth when he was coming down, make sure you turn the lights off. So in his bedroom, some, the, we've got two lights. So there's two switches. There's a, like the fan light, and then you have like the can lights. And um, so he comes downstairs, and I say, buddy, go turn the light off. He's like, I did turn the light off. And I look upstairs, and I'm like, now I can see the light in your room on. And he's like, I did turn the light off. He wanted to get upset. And I was like, listen, buddy. And he, and he thinks I'm mad at him because he didn't turn the light off. And I was like, just go turn the light off. I get it. You probably just turn one off, run up here and turn it off. And he looked at me and said, no, I'm not going to do that. And um, I said, mm, okay. Yeah, it's like 10, 30 at yeah, night. Yeah, and I said, buddy, you're going to go turn that light off. And, uh, and then he starts crying and whining. I turned it off. I turned it off, you know. And uh, finally, after some negotiation, he goes upstairs and we turn it off. But he, I had to explain to him, listen, I'm not mad that you didn't turn the light off because he, he kept crying that, he, you know, I turned the light off. I said, I'm not mad you didn't turn the light off, buddy. I said, the reason I'm upset and the reason you're being punished right now is because when I asked you to run back upstairs, you told me no. And, 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 and children have to know the difference between, like we're distinguishing here. Uh, and, and when you do discipline, you, you need to explain the why there why you're being corrected here, why you're being disciplined. And uh, it, it, unless you do, there's not going to be correction. There'll just be fear. And you, you don't want that. You, you want there to be correction. You want there to be adjustment made on their part. And because so I think these things do affect other people. And that's why it's so important that you, you know, discipline from dishonesty, disobedience, yeah. and disrespect because it affects other people, those people around them. And our kids yeah. need to recognize that, and that's why they need to go make it right. Yeah. I mean, it's not just for Cross to go turn the light off, but he had to make it right with his daddy because he disrespected his daddy. And it's the same thing when, when they go to school or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It, we, they just need to realize that it affects other people. It's yeah. not that we just told them no. They're really affecting yeah. other people. And I think that's the biggest this. thing. Whenever you look in the Bible, you look at the Old Testament, and you look at the law that's given, there's this idea about restitution. So if you steal from somebody, you have to give back what you stole, but also some on top of that. And, and the point of, of the law is, hey, I, I, it's not that you get the law right or that you get the check in the box. And I think sometimes some of us that are you know type A type people, which I am not, we want to make sure we get the check in the box, that our children get the check in the box, that they do what they're supposed to be doing because it's the right thing to do. But if we can connect that disobedience to a person to say, because you didn't do this or because you did do this, this person was affected in a negative way, that makes it more per, uh, personal to them and it helps them to understand the consequences of what they have done wrong. Uh, and, and so I think that's really important. It's not, hey, just follow the rules because I said so, but it's one of those things. And sometimes I said so is a legitimate answer when they ask why. But at some point you have to say, because you didn't do this or because you did do this, this person has suffered. This person has been injured as a result of that. Uh, and connecting it to a person I think has a lot more impact on them uh, whenever you get to doing that. So um, anything else? No, I think another biblical principle is cherish them while you can. 
Um, in Mark 10, verse 13 and 16, it says, One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. You know, Jesus loved the kids. Yeah. He cherished the kids. We, too, have to be that way and not just be like, oh, my God, I'm having kids and we're going through this hard time. We need to find those moments to cherish them, even in the midst yeah. of discipline and um, the times that they hurt our feelings or hurt our heart because we feel like we raised them even later on in life when they're 17, 18 and doing yeah. things that are not the what you've taught them. But yet, no, there are times we have to cherish our children. Yeah. And, um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I think this is really the other side of the coin concerning discipline. Your discipline will only come across as rage and anger if you don't take the time to love your kids and spend time with them. And, and, and your discipline, I think, would be a lot more effective when you do take the time to cherish them. And all of you that have children much older than I do, you realize how quick that time goes by. I mean, I can just, I mean, it seems like only a few months ago I was holding cross in my arms as a little baby. And now here he is, you know, going to be, eight, you know, seven, you know, what is he going to be, eight? Eight, <laughs> eight years eight. old yeah. in, in a couple months. And, I mean, that's how fast it goes. I'm like, seven, eight, what, what is he? And, and the thing about it is, is that w when you spend time with your children, you create those bonds of affection. And our culture now you know, people are waiting longer and longer to have children. People are sometimes saying, I, I, I think it was um, Chelsea Handler or somebody I was, she did this whole rant about how great her life was without children, and uh, which is fine if that's for you, I guess. But, the, you know, the, what, it, what people end up seeing children as is like a necessary evil, unfortunately, sometimes. It's like, yeah, I guess that's the next thing to do. We have children, and they just kind of get in the way for a few years until I can get my life back on track. If you look at your children like that, they'll always seem like something in the way of what you want to be able to do. And they can, listen, they are your purpose. They are your goal. They are the center of your life for a while. And taking the time to cherish them, to draw them nearer, into, you know, nearer to yourself, to you know, spend some time with them doing fun things and, and making memories. And that's the thing I think that, that Brooks and I have really lately have been trying to be conscious of is make, taking time to make some positive memories with our kids. Whether it is going out in the yard, throwing a baseball, playing bat I don't even like basketball. I hate it, all right? And yet, Cross has got this great love for basketball right now, and so he wants me to go outside and play basketball with him. I'm like, your mama's the state champion. She's the one to play basketball, right? But uh, but we both go out there. But she goes out there and she's like, okay, I got to get ready. I got to get up early in the morning. And he's like, hey, Daddy, you want to go play with me? So I end up going and playing with him, right? And this is the thing we've got to understand. We've got to cherish them. We have got to take the time to make some positive memories with your children. And that's one of the things I'm really trying to do as a parent right now is not be so busy that I can't hey, say, hey, let's let's – you know, take, let's take, you know, I'll get you from school an hour early. We're going to go to the movies and make these positive memories with your children. It makes the discipline that much more effective, but it also makes life much more enjoyable because it's, you know, that's what is Jesus said, deny yourself, come after me. When you have children, just deny yourself. Get rid of your hobbies, get rid of all that other stuff, and just start enjoying your kids. So, And um, show interest in their interests. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes, you know, we kind of push off the things that we've done, you know, whether it is like the basketball, how much I love that game, and me try to force that on one of my kids. We need to figure out what the interests are for them. Because, look, God created your kids in the image of him, not in the image of you. And with this cherishing, also, he um, didn't make your kids like any other else anybody else's kids. So therefore, when you cherish them, take the comparison off of the table as well. Don't compare your kids to each other. Don't compare your kids to somebody else's kids. 
realize that, you know, God created them in his image and it's up to us to find out their interests, whatever it is. If it's reading books, if it's painting, if it's, I don't know, building Legos and maybe one day be an engineer, whatever that is, but don't force your, your interests on them. Kind of let them figure that out. And I think sometimes we don't do that because we just want to birth babies to have a best friend. Or we want to birth something so you can hang out and do, I don't know. Go to the movies. But anyway, do you see what I'm saying? We don't have we should not be having kids to bring us a sidekick. We should be having kids to, to impact the kingdom of God. And so when we recognize what it is that that they're doing and help cultivate, look by the Holy Spirit, God will show you. He will lead you. You may be unfamiliar because there's many, I mean, we have sat with people that say, I don't have anything in common with. That's up to you to figure that out. Because if you don't, the world will try to send him people that he can relate to. So you may have to do things you don't like or that you're not familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, th- I don't, I don't, that doesn't mean you don't expose them to different things. You know, if, you know, they say, well, I don't want to do, you know, karate or I don't want to do basketball or whatever. Well, we'll try it, you know, and, and, you know, you want to encourage them to try different things. But at the same time, if you find they're having an interest in this, if it's just something that you don't like and you don't want to get involved in them because that's not your interest, well, make it your interest and, and try to encourage that. Now, kids, you know, are flighty, so they may be interested in that one week and then the next week they're interested in something else. But once you find something that they, they stay with longer than a week or two weeks or a month or, you know, something, and they really own it, show some interest in that because when they know you care about that, they feel like you care about them. Um, so... Um, here's the here's the uh, third thing here that I want to uh, is that we should teach them consistently, uh, and that means taking every opportunity to teach. Deuteronomy 11 says this, and I love the way this is worded in the Old Testament. So commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these words of mine. This is the Lord speaking. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Teach them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that as long as the sky remains above the earth, you and your children may flourish in the land that the Lord swore to give to you and your ancestors. So here, this is the command from God to teach his his laws, to teach his commandments, to teach his, the children about who he is and what he expects from, from their lives. And we need to make it a point to use every opportunity we have to teach our children. Sometimes that's planned, sometimes it's not, but you know, we need to teach them about God, we need to teach them about life. We need to teach them about consequences, all those kinds of things. And this is, you know, this is, like, when I say planned, you know, yeah, two, three times a week, sit down. Let's, let's do, let's read the Bible. You know, Cross and I do a little catechism, and we go over that, and I just ask him questions about God, and he responds to me about what they are and all that kind of stuff. Maybe you do something like that. Maybe you just read stories from the Bible, and y'all talk about them a little bit later on. Uh, because if you don't teach them about God, the world's going to teach them about God or teach them about a God who is not. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that that is a primary focus. But we also want to teach them about what kind of people they ought to be. Uh, and, and the type of how they ought to treat other people and all that kind of stuff and, and practicing those things so that you practice what it is to act at a table at the home. And then when they go to a restaurant, they're not acting crazy. You know, sometimes they probably still will. Uh, it's not like they'll get it right. But it's not, you know, we shouldn't be upset with our children if we've never sat down at a meal together and ate at the house and sat and, and talked about, you know, had conversation, and then we go to a restaurant and they don't know how to do it. And so we got to take every opportunity we can to teach our children how to respect people, what it means to be a good person, how we ought to treat people who are less fortunate than we are, and all those kinds of different things. And, and not only teach them the what, but we want to teach them who they ought to be. Um, and, and I think that's vitally important. So. And I think we need to be um, ready, and, and I like how we wrote this. I don't know if it's up there, spontaneous teaching. Um, you know, 
many times when when I pray, I'm like, God, let our kids see and us as well those opportunities of um, where they can learn something or where I can teach something. Um, just last night we had the disco thing, and afterwards I had my neighbor's kid, um, just one of them, and we had to drop somebody off. And on the way home, she had some deep questions that. I was like, God, this is such an opportunity of teaching. And we talked about God and we talked about the church and what the church is here for and how we are to, you know, bring people alongside of us. And it was just such a spontaneous opportunity to teach. So, you know, if you're going back and forth and you're tired, um, you're in that phase of carrying your kids here and there and everybody else's kids in your vehicle, look at it as a time of teaching them. Because there's a reason that God put them in your vehicle or in your path and say, God, I'm going to teach on you. Ask them questions. You know, don't just start spitting out, you know, um, scripture. But like last night, she asked me questions. And by asking questions, you can you can lead that conversation in teaching. You know, another spontaneous, um, well, type teaching is in something that we do with our kids is we share with them the hard things. Um, and, and I think I've shared this before, the passing of my mom and, and pray, knowing that we've prayed for years for healing. And Cross was older with Brantley, but he, he, he saw that it didn't take place the way we wanted it to. Um, and so we had to bring Cross alongside of that saying, but God is still good. God is still here. He hears your cries. He hears your prayers. And you will see her one day. Um, another teaching that I remember that um, Brantley, and I've shared this before maybe in one of our previous things about children, is um, one day she was she's completely covered in these, I don't know, knots, bumps. It was a bad phase she went through and was just hurting and itching. It was something we couldn't figure out. We had gone back and forth to the doctor. And I remember her standing in front of the mirror and was like, why has God not healed me? And I was like, um, is God still good? She was like, yes, God's still sovereign, which means everything goes through his hands. But guess what, baby? Just keep praying and loving on God. And we had to teach her through that, that he may not have heard them prison. Now, he did heal her, and she walked in that, but she had to wrestle that out. And those are things that are okay to wrestle out with your kids in teaching. Wrestle that thing out with God. If you don't understand, talk about it. You, you want your kids not to be scared to come to you, and you don't want them to be scared to go to God. And so look for op opportunities like that, that through the good, through the bad, through the hard times of your life. God uses each and every one of those times to teach your kids. Don't just shelter them and at not let them feel how, I don't know, the hardness of life is at times. I know our kids are four and six, but we share hard things with them to a certain degree because if not, they're not going to be prepared and they're just going to you know, be crushed if something happens later in life. They're five and seven. What? They're five and six. What seven, did I say? Four and six. Oh, gosh. It goes by As fast. I know, we struggle. It so. goes by fast. <laughs> we struggle with that part. Oh, gosh. All right. Less. less but I think six. you're on, though. You're, you're right on, Brooks. I think so. Like, I have, a lot of times I have to leave the house on a, on a Saturday to go do a wedding. So we get to talk. Sometimes we take that opportunity to teach them about what it means to really love, you know, when two people fall in love, that kind of thing. Or, or sometimes, unfortunately, when I have a funeral and, uh, which is, you know, more times I'd like to count and, and I have to talk to cross about what I need to do, you know, cause you know, it's not just that I, you know, you go and you see somebody, you know, prior to that and you go to the house and check on them. And Brantley's been with me a couple of times to a couple of these things and, and, and watch me go in and try to comfort a family member or something like that's lost a loved one. And uh, so you just, you look at those, look at those as opportunities to, hey, teach your children about life. And again, if you don't teach them about life and how it ought to be lived, somebody will, somebody's going to. And they so. will watch how you respond in difficult, difficult times. And that leads to our last one. Oh, model godliness. Um, in Proverbs 20, verse 7, it says, The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. We have to live a life of godliness, goodness and godliness. And um, that, like I said, they watch you. They'll see how you respond. They'll see how much you are in the Word of God. They'll see how much you go to the church, how you love on people. We need to walk like we have a relationship with Jesus. Amen? And when you do that, it will cause you not to just get the checks 
in the box, but you'll love him from what he's done for you. And your kids will see that you're walking um, set apart. You're not like everybody else. Um, so, yeah. I, uh, I think this is really important because whether you realize it or not, you're always teaching something. Always. The question is, what are you teaching them? Uh, the, the old adage, hey, more is caught than taught, I think is very true. Uh, and, and I'll just give you a, a very negative example. Um, at some time back, I got really frustrated with Brantley. She was in one of, her, one of these things where she wasn't doing anything you asked her to do, and then you'd talk to her trying to correct her or do something, and she'd just talk to you back. And she wasn't mad or, or being, like, defiant or nothing. She just was completely ignoring anything you had to say, and I was getting frustrated because – so I'd get her to stop doing one thing, and then she'd go to her room, and she'd start doing something that was probably way worse. And so I was just like, oh, my gosh. And I got I said, Brantley, you have got to stop. You've got to calm down because she was just like, bou- literally bouncing off the walls. I said, you've got to calm down. I got so frustrated with her. And, and about three or four days later, she was up there giving her brother a hard time, and I start and I heard him yell at her, Brantley, you've got to calm down. Leave me alone. And I thought to myself, hmm, I know where he learned that. You know what I mean? And, and it really got me to thinking, you know, it, it's not, you know, and I get it. Kids get frustrated with each other and that kind of thing. But they're watching how you respond when things don't go right. They're watching how you respond when you face challenges. And for you, you've got to work hard to model that godliness. And so er, now, ever since then, one of the things I've tried to do, I've not done this perfectly, obviously, is, is try to respond in as calm a way as I possibly can because I said to Cross after that, you don't yell at your sister like that. But in the back of my mind, I thought about, but I did it. You know what I mean? I did it. So why, why wouldn't he? Why, why wouldn't he? He saw Daddy do it. And, and we have to be very careful because whether or not you realize it, you're always teaching your children something. The question is, what are you teaching them? They're watching you, and, and we don't think they're paying attention to us, but they are. They know hey, you, you may be having a conversation, and they may be looking at a tablet or whatever, but <laughs> they hear what you say. And they have that selective hearing and because uh, they, they can come back and repeat some of those same things you said. Sometimes that means I do have to apologize to my children. Right? I haven't, anybody ever had to do that? You had to go back and say, man, I, I, I shouldn't have raised my voice like that. I shouldn't have got that frustrated. I need you to forgive Daddy. I'm sorry. Uh, and sometimes that means I have to apologize. You know why? Because I want them to be able to admit when they got it wrong and go and apologize. And when they see that I can do it, then they're going to be more a, a, uh, apt to do it as well. Um, Another one is um, pray with them. and um, And I'm not just talking about nighttime is great, in the morning is great, um, you know, any time that you're, like I said, we try to use the um, time in the vehicle, you know, doesn't matter, my kids or whoever's kids, let's pray, What you you know, try to do that, but um, I know one way for us is we've started allowing our kids to pray for us and over us, um, and so when we do go through hard things, or like this morning when Sam and I were in the room, we were like, Cross, we need you to pray over us because we want them to see they're a part of this journey that God's called us to. It's not just about me and Sam, but we're going doing this together as a family. And he grabbed our hands and he prayed. He prayed over the message. But when we allow them to do that, yeah, it'd have been easier for me and Sam to just go ahead and spit out a prayer. But that included them in your life and in what God was doing. And so not should we just pray for them, but let them pray for you. And so that way they're, they're exercising what they've learned. Yep. Anyway, hopefully this will help. Like I said, I may come back in uh, 12 years and be like, none of this worked. Uh, <laughs> I doubt it. These are, I like to say, I think these are biblical principles. Here's the key to some of this, though. It has to be done consistently. You can't do this three or four days and then the rest of the time do what you ever, whatever you feel like doing. You have to discipline yourself through the power of the Holy Spirit to do all of these consistently, to discipline them consistently. One of the things I learned as a middle school teacher is that if you are not consistent, 
in the way you discipline and what you discipline for, kids will pick up on that. They will pick up, you know, why did you let them do that? And, and then I got in trouble, you know, that kind of thing. You've got to be consistent. And you've got to be consistent in the way I think you apply these principles, whether you discipline with love, how you cherish them. Every week you need to find some way to cherish your children. You need to find some time where you can spend some positive time with them. You know, whether it is, you know, how you are able to um, model godliness and, and goodness towards other people. You know, if you stop and, and, and find a, you know, some way to serve somebody, may, you know, make sure, hey, I, you know, sometimes I look at my, you know, if there's somebody that has a need or something like that, uh, that I, and, and one of the things I have done is like, if I got to go make a visit to somebody's house, sometimes I'll, I'll pull one of my youngins in with me and let them go with me. And, and, and I, cause I want to model some of that kind of stuff of servanthood and, and humility and being able to reach out and touch somebody's life and make a difference. And, and we need to make sure we're consistent with that. Not just in fits and starts. We're adults. We need to suck it up and do it even when we don't feel like doing it. And then the next day, you get up and you do it when you don't feel like doing it. And then the next day, you get up and you do it when you don't feel like doing it. And when you do these things, I believe, because like I say, they are God-given biblical principles, it's going to make a difference in the type of children that we raise as God's people. So, if you will, let's stand. Here's what I want to do this morning. Um, if you have a child that is under 18 years old, just put your hand in the air. All right. God bless you. All right. I'm praying for you. I got mine in there. Pray for me. I, I, I really believe that if we can understand the different phases we're at with our children and, and we can apply this, uh, it, it'll make parenting I won't say easier. It's always going to be hard, but at least it'll make it um, much more. Uh, I, I think it'll make it much more um, accessible, so that, that we feel like we're not completely in the dark as far as what we got to do. Um, so I'm going to pray for y'all, especially those of you that raise your hand. If you got a parent, if you got children that are over 18 and have, li you know, live, they're now living their life, they're out of the house, all that kind of stuff. These other people need your prayers, and they need your, hey, they need your input from time to time. And I would, I would advise all of us that have children to go find somebody who has been through this. And they will tell you, you know, some of their regrets, some of their advice, all that kind of stuff. Don't feel like that Google can give you the answers to parenting, all right? Go find somebody that's done it, and they've tried to do it in a Christian way. And, and, and ask them about it. So let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you, Lord, for every parent in the room. God, I thank you, Father, for the blessing of children. Lord, you have said in your word that, that children are like arrows in, in the quiver of a, of a strong man. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would see our children as that, that we would seek to shape and to mold them into to what you would have them to be, and we would be ready to pull back that string and release them on the world, to show the, that they may be able to show the world who Christ is, to reflect godly character and goodness to all they encounter. God, I pray, Father, right now that we would not ever see our children as a burden or in the way of what we want to accomplish. We we don't want to make them gods either, but at the same time, God, we don't want to dismiss them or feel like, dear God, that they're somehow a hindrance to what we really want to do with our lives. I pray, God, that we would be able, dear God, as parents to deny ourselves, invest in our children, find out who they are, and, but more importantly, who God would have them be and seek to steer them in that direction. Help us to be able to discipline them with love. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, to be able to say and to do the right things that would not only give them wisdom, but teach them who they ought to be in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would also help us to be able, dear God, to to cherish them, to embrace them as, as Christ was able to embrace children, as he was able and, and he loved to be around them, and it seems that they love to be around him. God, I pray that we would be the type of parents that children enjoy, 
I'm praying that for Brooks and myself, Lord. I know at times we got to discipline. At times we got to, you know, we got to kind of uh, rein things in. But at the same time, God, I pray that we, that our children would know that we enjoy them. That's my personal prayer, God. And that we cherish them and we want to spend time with them. God, I'm asking, Lord, that you would help us in addition to that. That we would be able to teach them what is good and what is right. That we would take the, the time, we would plan time, dear God, a few times a week to, to get into the Word of God. We would plan time, whether it's helping them with their homework, to teach them about life. Or whether it is, dear God, looking, uh, using spontaneous things like, like death or sickness or marriage or whatever to teach our children about love and life and all the, all the things in between. God, I pray, God, that you would just help us to make the most of every opportunity. Give us wisdom in doing that. And most importantly, God, I pray that we could, Lord, be models of goodness and godliness. That, Lord, that our lives would be a sweet fragrance to you. Lord, that our children would see that we are really trying to live a life that pleases God. Lord, we wouldn't be one thing in front of everybody else and then something else behind the scenes, God. And our children know the truth. God, I pray that the truth that they know is that we're trying to live godly and good lives. And the truth that they know is that we dearly love them and care for them. And the truth that they know is that we seek God's will for their life and we want what is best for them and we want them to have a blessed life. God, I pray they know those things from our heart. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless y'all. Thank y'all for being here this morning.